So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. First, I'm very grateful to Roma and Sergey for organizing this online conference. Today, I will be presenting one of my recent studies here, How to Curse and Kill Your Enemies, Ritual of Violence from Karakoto. As Roma mentioned yesterday, my talk today will touch on the darker side of local society at Karakoto. So the presentation consists of three main parts. First one is introduction, the ritual and the manuscript. Second one is a comparative study of Chinese and Tibetan ritual texts, which then moves on to conclusion. So let me start by giving you some basic knowledge about this topic. This study examines Tibetan Buddhist tantric texts from Karakoto. After the fall of the Tibetan empire in the 19th century, the Tibetan language continued to be used as an international lingua franca by non-Tibetan people, and the Tibetan Buddhism kept flourishing in Central Asia from the 10th to the 14th century. The Tangut Empire was a major state in Central Asia from the 11th to the 13th century, and was profoundly influenced by Tibetan Buddhism. On the slide is a map produced by the ERC project, Buddhist Road, at the center of for religious studies at Huo Bohum University. One can see the boundaries of the Tangut Empire in 1150. The spread of Tibetan Buddhism to the Tangut Empire is reflected in the document unearthed at Karakoto. Scholars have found Tibetan Buddhist texts in multiple languages at Karakoto, including mainly Tibetan, Chinese, and Tangut. For more information, you can refer to the three publications on the slide. Among these vast Tibetan Buddhist texts, texts from Karakoto, today we focus on one category of tantric ritual texts called Yuan Ren Li e Xing, ritual of making use of human effigies. Yuan Ren is used to transcribe the Tibetan word Zhu Qia, the object of the ritual, which refers to an, the animal person or spirit targeted by the ritualist. The Chinese word Li e, sometimes written as Langge, is transcribed from a Tibetan term, Linga, a phonetic transliteration of the Sanskrit term, Linga. Literally means mark or sign. It is used to designate substitute effigy in the tantric ritual context. The use of effigies has been found in ancient Greece, India, Egypt, China, and later in Japan, and being used by African people, this type of ritual device is widely referred to as voodoo doll in popular culture. For the voodoo dolls or human effigies in Tibetan Buddhism, the most important research available comes from quivers. The information on his, uh, on his article is on the slide. Based on the previous studies, I'm introducing the basic principle of the ritual and explain how this ritual comes to be established. In the operations, the practitioner makes an image in the likeness of a victim. Victim, uh, The practitioner casts a magical power on the effigy and thereby achieves his purpose of effecting the ritual target. This ritual is based on the principle of similarity, which presumes that there is some invisible connection between two analogous uh, objects. Through this kind of bond, the ritualist can manipulate his victim. So in the Karakoto documents, we find four main texts containing the ritual involving the use of human effigies. I have written one article to introduce this document. Here, I will go, I just go through these four texts quickly. The first text is called Yu Hu Shen Qiu Xiu, the invocation of Yu Hu Shen. But I haven't quite figured out which deity Yu Hu Shen is, but I think she may well be Kurukula. Another point worth noting is that this text is a Nimaba text attributed to Benama Sambawa. So this manuscript dated, is dated to 13th to 14th century, and uh, uh, it, it is a booklet with a stitched uh, binding. So it's a physical format of this uh, text. So the next text, uh, the second manuscript is called Tsu Da He Yao Men. So uh, it, the text is also dated to the 13th to the 14th centuries uh, and uh, it is bound in a, uh, how to say, 
uh, palm, palm flat form. So you can see also this, uh, the photocopies of this text on the slide. So, and uh, the third text here is called Da Hei Chiu Xiu Bing Zuo Fa, the ritual text on invocation and the practice of Makara. So this text is also dated to the 13th to 14th century, and it's also a booklet binding format. And the fourth text, it's called DX178. So it's actually a collection of a Tibetan tantric ritual texts consisting, consisting mainly of certain texts on various forms of the Makala, plus other texts related to uh, Nara Shimha and uh, Vajrapani. And uh, <clears throat> this uh, scroll is dated to late 12th century to the 14th century. And it's, it, it is a scroll form. form, form. And the uh, scholar Alexander Zorin has studied this scroll, made a transcription and a translation in Russian and offered a photocopies of the manuscript. So now with a basic knowledge of this manuscript, we move on to the study of the ritual. So here we focus only on two manuscripts, tech, uh, Tibetan scroll DX178 and a Chinese manuscript B59. So uh, comparative study reveals four ritual texts involving human effigies in Tibetan scroll DX178 are translated into Chinese and included in uh, B5, uh, B59 Chinese manuscript. So this, this study will, own own, will take one of the four as an example and address three main questions. The first is, how did this ritual text spread to the Tangut Empire? And the second is, how is the ritual of using human effigies, effigies uh, performed? And the third is, what is the ritual performed for? So actually, previously, we did not know the origin of the Chinese text B59 until the Tibetan text DX178 was rediscovered. So actually, when Shen Weirong published his study of the Chinese Mahakala documents of Karakoto in 2005, the Tibetan scroll DX-17 was still considered a Dunhuang document and it was not published. Zhou also uh, in his public publication in 2015, Zhou Lin also made no mention of the Chinese Mahakala literature in Karakoto. So it seems that uh, it seems that the two scholars both are not aware of the existence of uh, the the uh, Mahakala literature in another language. So based on their studies, I make a, compar uh, a comparative study of this two language document. Uh, my study shows that, the, shows that the name of the transmitter of the ritual, namely Ga Lao Zhawa, that appears in a number of Tibetan texts have been removed from their Chinese translations. So on the slide, you can see one example. I give you that from DX178. So actually, it's at the beginning part of the prayer part, you can see Bai Chenbo Ga Lo La Cha Ce Lo. But in the Chinese translation, we see that Jing Li Ji Xiang Hai Ru Ga. It means uh, the, the Tibetan translated into English, it means homage to the glorious uh, Ga Lo Zhawa. But in the Chinese, it means homage to the glorious Heru Ga. So uh, this suggests that Galozawa was important not only for the disseminations of the Tibetan texts of Mahakara, but also a source of a Chinese text. So you can see that the texts are identical, but in the Chinese version, you see the disappearing of the Galozawa's uh, uh, contribution to the text. But uh, my next question, is ask, asking who is this Galo Jawa? So uh, Galo Jawa Shunubet. So he, I assumed that he is a, a, a key figure in the spread of Mahakala teachings in the Tangkuda Empire. So I summarized the information from his uh, biography. So Galo Jawa was born in Dewu Chung, uh, the Zhongka area. So it's uh, actually the boundary between Sidu and the Tibetan lands. So in the 1130 to 1140, Galo Jawa had traveled to India and studied under Jami Lao Jawa, Sangye Jakpa, at the Dojie Den Monastery. Galo Jawa meditated, meditated 
at the Shitavada outside Buddha Gaya and visualized Makala and received the teaching from the deity. At the end of the 1140s, he passed through central Tibet and came to Eastern Kham to spread Buddhist teachings and remained there until 1155. So it is likely that Galajavar brought teachings of Mahakala all the way from India to Tibet. So I just select, select an episode which took place during his stay in East Kham. Here, we, I just read, I just show you my translation here. The local inhabitants of Gajong Zha begged him for, to pray for rain. At first, he did not accede to this request. But after their repeated pleas, he bestowed upon them the drum of the Lord, Chima, that were said to belong to the Tibetan emperor and instruct, wherever there's need of rain, strike this drum there. We'll wear a raincoat such as a felt garment before you go, because the rain comes down right away at the stroke of the drum. What happened next was exactly what he said it would be. So it's a translation from the biography of uh, of Galajava written by Lama Xiang, actually. So here we see a metaphorical description of his relationship with, uh, with the Tibetan emperor. So I, I actually uh, discussed uh, detailly, uh, det uh, in detail about this, uh, this episode in my paper uh, that would be published uh, in this year, uh, but in the framework of Buddhist Road uh, project uh, at Bochum University. So, but I'm not going to talk about uh, talk uh, uh, about the details here. I also discussed the uh, the historical development of this uh, uh, this uh, uh, this terminology drama of Lord Chima in Tibetan historical writings. There. So, now we move on to the second question. So, the, my next question is: How is the ritual of using human effigies performed? So we will take one text as an example and concentrate on three aspects of the ritual. The first one is the ritual structure. Second one is the mantra recitation. And the third is the materials used for the ritual. So the text, uh, the Tibetan and the Chinese text uh, uh, are given also on the slide. So the page numbers of the text, you see. So here, I will not go into the details of the specific textual studies here, but mainly summarize the basic structure of the ritual. The ritual is performed according to the Karakoto documents. I mean, the ritual is performed in eight steps. The first step is evoking the tutelary deity Mahakala. The second one is drawing an image or molding a door resembling the target. The third is visualizing that Mahakala separates the target from its a diviner protector. And the fourth is visualizing that Mahakala causes the target to be powerless and absorbed into the image. The fifth is inserting the image into the door. And the sixth is liberating or you can say killing the target by pricking the door with a needle or destroying it with a chopper. The seventh is making offering to Mahakala and sealing the dirty away. So the eighth is discarding the used of destroy the door into the flowing water or burying it in an uh, uh, ominous uh, ground. So the ritual is done, as you can see, the ritual is done through a combination of visualization and practical uh, op uh, operations. So the Mahakara part, it's, it's, uh, pre uh, it's uh, re realized through the visualization or meditation by the practitioner. Uh, the deity at the center of a ritual can also be replaced by other deities, for example, Yamadaka or Marichi or Yuhushan. As the central deity changes, the seeds, words, and the mantra of the ritual change. But the basic structure of the ritual remains the same. Here we also say during, uh, during the performance of the ritual, one, the practitioner should also recite the following uh, mantras. First is Om Vajra Mahaya, Maharaya, Mah uh, Maraya, such as such, hum hum pat. So here I gave also the Chinese and Tibetan transliteration. So it means ma, uh, Maraya is a causative form from Mri, kill. So kill somebody, such and such, or Mao Jia, or in Tibetan, Che Gang Mao, this blanket is used uh, 
by the practitioner, you can also fill this bracket with the name of your enemy, Zhang Shan or Li Si, or, or, or the other, other people's name. I don't know. So, and also the next, uh, the next, uh, uh, the next uh, uh, part, I will draw, you, uh, draw your attention to the Maturi culture of, uh, in uh, Karakoto. So we can also say from the ritual text, the door is made of, do uh, the, the door, is, I mean, the, this, you know, Putara or Putali is made of a door, uh, made of various kinds of unlucky soul. It's called Fu, Fu Xiang Tu. So I translated it literally unlucky soul. Uh, so it's, it's uh, about, for example, earth from a buried ground, the dirt trodden on by the victim, the soil from a track of those who died without of spring, the pen used to draw the image of the of your target is made of a human bone or a quill from a riven a pigment made of a poison salt or the black mustard seed as powder mixed with human blood. And the portrait of the target should be drawn on paper, a birch bark or on the claws from the cremation ground. So, and also uh, the uh, and also next question I would like to draw, uh, to uh, answer, what is this ritual performed for? So the call of the TK312, uh, 312, as we have introduced before, is a ritual collection divided into 38 sections. The first through four sections are the general uh, preparatory procedures, while the fifth to the 38th comprise of 34 individual ritual options. These rituals seem to have been gathered from numerous sources and a, a majority of them make use of human effigies. I'm not going uh, through, through them uh, one by one, but here I would give you some examples. For example, the purpose of most of, of these rituals uh, involving the use of human effigies are vicious. For example, the seventh is for inflicting harm on one's enemies. The ninth is for sowing discord between other people or for helping with the prison break, for obstructing the trade of other people, for expelling others from their hometown, and for transferring um, medicine into, uh, transforming medicine into poison and such and such. So these rituals are worldly oriented and fall into the categories of a subjugation, we know that, or uh, ferocity uh, or killing, uh, in addition, we also see there are two other types, uh, uh, Vida Vesa, provoking enmity between friends and lovers, and uh, Ucha Tana, causing someone to leave his village or hometown. So here, now we're going to this, we are moving on to, uh, on to this conclusion part. So here we mainly, so far, we have found a number of ritual texts of making human images within effigies within the Karakoto collections. The texts are mainly in Chinese and Tibetan languages. There's some evidence that tantric texts uh, in Chinese were also used by practitioners of Tangut ethnic groups. Well, uh, I will give you some uh, one example here. Uh, you can see this is a uh, uh, Chinese manuscript TK262. So on the back side of one page, we see a uh, 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 we see uh, a line of uh, Tangut characters. So I translate is, uh, I, I, I translate as Om, True Buddha and Holy Shit, Dao Sri. So it's obviously not finished. So this text, Om is a seed syllable and this kind of probably a, a, a commentary on this uh, seed syllable or something. I don't know, but, but this text, this line, I mean, is a, is a Buddhist nature and that the scribe is familiar with Tangut script. We can see from here, the scribe who writes this uh, line must be familiar with the Tangut script. We may assume that the person who, uh, who wrote this line was most probably a Tangut Buddhist. This is an evidence indicating that these Chinese Mahakala texts were accessible, uh, accessible to Tangut tantric practitioners. So here for the physical form, I will say that these texts were mostly bound within portable booklets. And in the final section of these booklets, we find the diagrams that teach how to arrange offering, produce the visualization. The binding forms and the arrangement of these documents show that they were 
produced for very practical purpose and carried around by the practitioners like manuals and used to guide them through the rituals. This fusic feature suggests indirectly that such rituals of making human effigies were popular among the local peoples of Karakoto at that time. So uh, these magical operations using human effigies mainly designed to control and change the complex of realities in the sphere of social relations. They mirror the way in which people react to the adverse situation and the violence inherited in the social communities that they live in. So I would like to argue as the last point is, at the uh, last point is the significance of these rituals for understanding the local community in uh, Karakoto. So uh, here is my talk uh, and thank you for your attention. And I also wish you all happy new Chinese New Year in advance. Thank you all.